was promoted to full professor in 2009. And in general, Dr. Lucier's interests are in the synaptic and circuit effects of drugs of abuse. And his lab has made a number of really fascinating discoveries about the consequences of drug use and identified unique forms of uh, plasticity that occur after following administration of drugs abuse, such as cocaine. Um, in addition, his lab has also done really elegant circuit work detailing how connections between circuits in the ventral basal ganglia, like the nucleus accumbens, and its output systems, like the hypothalamus and ventral pallidum, mediate reward-related processes and reward learning, and also in feeding processes. So hopefully, in the in last few years, uh, Dr. Lucia has really been an advocate for advancing a circuit model of addiction and trying to identify nodes that are particularly sensitive to uh, drug-induced neuroadaptations and how we might be able to take advantage of modern tools like optogenetics in order to actually reverse this plasticity and restore um, adaptive behaviors. So I think today we're going to get a sense of some of that work that's going on in his lab and maybe a, a little bit of a precise of, of such a theory. Um, so I'll let Christian take it away. I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, and also before we start, um, please use the Q&A to put questions as they come up throughout the talk. And at the end, we'll have plenty of time. And uh, Marie and I will moderate asking Christian uh, those questions. Uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for having me. It is actually a great pleasure to have uh, to give a talk here, the last talk. And I would like to take the opportunity to first thank all other uh, speakers of, we had 24 talks over the last uh, year, starting in spring until now. I would like to thank all the speakers who uh, gave excellent talks, but I also would like, of course, to thank all the attendees. We uh, did keep track and uh, we had about six and a half thousand attendees, interestingly more on YouTube than uh, those following us on live. And as Marina already said, there is the opportunity to watch them all again. Um, I would like as a third group also especially like to thank all the co-hosts uh, who have uh, guided you through these uh, talks, uh, the trainee co-hosts as well as uh, fellow PIs. It, it was really a great experience. I did learn a lot. So here is actually the way you're gonna to connect to YouTube. If you are looking for our archives, just type in into YouTube, WWN Neurobiology of Addiction, and you find our channel, Neurobiology of Addiction, and then you have uh, in chronological order, all the talks that, uh, that, uh, that we uh, broadcasted. But let's now, go back and uh, talk about uh, my own work. And I would like today to take you on a journey where we look at the transition from controlled drug use to compulsive drug use. We all agree that addiction is a disease that evolves in several steps. There's an initiation phase. In other words, you obviously have to expose yourself to an addictive substance in order to be at risk to develop an addiction which is followed by a honeymoon phase where people experience pleasure, stay in control, and have what is called a recreational use. What, however, we also know is that after some time, a fraction of people- Christian, are you, are you advancing your slides? Because yes, so this is not your, working? No, we're still seeing your, okay. fit, your uh, sure. start slide. Okay, then let me, let me unshare and then, um, and then I have to share the entire thing, I guess. So, so is, is that, okay. So this was my, <laughs> so, so you saw this. So this is my, uh, my, my uh, thank you slide for all the people who have given talks, the attendees, as well as my co-host. Here is the way you can connect to our, um, uh, YouTube channel, WWN, Neurobiology of Addiction, where you can chronological order find all the talks. So my talk today is going to be on determinants of the transition to compulsion in addiction. And this is a stage that happens in the addiction process, which is uh, occurring in several steps. So clearly, in order to get addicted, you have to expose yourself to a drug, uh, whether it's nicotine or something other. This is highly context dependent, typically in a social setting. And that is typically followed then by a honeymoon phase 
where uh, people have pleasure taking a drug, they stay in control, it is a recreational use. We then know that a fraction of people, typically around 20%, however, lose control and start to use and seek the drugs compulsively despite negative consequences that also arise. We know that for some of the drugs, and that's particularly true for opiates, but also for nicotine that induce also a strong degree of dependence, withdrawal is associated with a very negative state. Uh, and that then can typically triggered by the context also again lead to a loss of control and to compulsive use. In other words, what I'm trying to convey here is that there are sort of two forces that might drive someone from control use to compulsive use. One is a positive reinforcement. The fact of taking the drug makes you more likely to take it again. And there is a negative form of negative reinforcement whereby people try to avoid this negative affect state and that may also contribute. Today, I would mostly like to focus on this positive reinforcement element because we simply know more and that is what we have first uh, really worked on over the last uh, years. We have much evidence that this positive reinforcement starts in a tiny part of the brain, the ventral tegmental area at the tip of the brainstem, where here I have drawn schematically the principal neurons that uh, release dopamine and the interneurons that are GABAergic. And when, for example, a drug such as nicotine activates the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the dopamine neurons, that increases uh, the firing of these and leads to an en en enhanced uh, dopamine release. This is seminal work done by Marina when she was a postdoc in Champion Changer's lab in Paris. Another way to increase dopamine is by block blocking its reuptake. So dopamine neurons have this uh, special property of releasing dopamine, not only in the target region, such as the accumbens, but also already in the VTA through dendritic release. And if that dopamine then is, which is usually taken up by dopamine transporter, which can be blocked by cocaine, amphetamine, or ecstasy, in these circumstances, we also have an increase of dopamine. Last but not least, there is a third class of drugs that works indirectly where the primary target are actually the GABA interneurons. And in this group, we have the opiates, GHB, benzodiazepine, and cannabis. And they, through their respective GPCRs or GABA-A receptors, work on by inhibiting those GABA neurons, by hyperpolarizing them, by release, by decreasing the release probability. And that leads then to a disinhibition because the usual break exerted by these GABA neurons disappears. We can now, with the advent of these genetically encoded fluorescent indicator of dopamine, directly visualize the dopamine that is released by addictive drugs in the nucleus accumbens, for example. So an experiment first to validate this approach, which uses this D-light that is in essence a uh, part of the human dopamine receptor D1 coupled to a uh, permutated form of uh, GCAMP, uh, which then changes its fluorescence as a function of the binding of dopamine. We have used that and validated this by doing a optogenetic stimulation in the ventral tegmental area, and then in a frequency dependent fashion, seeing increases in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So we can use that obviously after this validation to test drugs. And here, what I would like to show you is the opposition between a highly addictive drug such as cocaine and a hallucinogen like psilocybin, which is not addictive. And as you can easily see, an IP injection of psilocybin does not lead to a change in fluorescence. So there's no change in dopamine in the accumbens in response to psilocybin. And that is in stark contrast with cocaine. So here you have the group data that clearly separates an addictive drug from a hallucinogen that is not addictive. This approach can also be used uh, 
to test molecules where addiction liability is st still debated. And the example I'm showing you here is ketamine. And what we have done is exactly the same experiment, d light in the nucleus accumbens, and then IP injection of ketamine. And you can see that there is indeed an increase of dopamine, which however, is much faster compared to cocaine. So there's a kinetic difference. You can also use then such fluorescent indicators. And here we're now switching to GCAM that allows us to monitor the activity of the neurons in genetically identified neurons. We can use that by transfecting it either into dopamine or into GABA neurons to understand what the activity is that drives this dopamine release in the accumbens. And when you look in the uh, uh, dopamine neurons, you see that they, in response to cocaine, decrease their firing frequency, which is a well-established and well-described effect of autoreceptors. The D2 receptors on the dopamine neurons get activated and that slows down their firing. By contrast, however, ketamine has this transient increase of the firing of the dopamine neurons, which explains the dopamine transients in the accumbens. When you now switch to the GABA neurons, you see that cocaine has no effect on those. That's not so surprising, but ketamine leads to a strong inhibition. So taken together, this activity monitoring along with the uh, dopamine monitoring in the accumbens leads to a model whereby we would classify ketamine in that third group that would work through this inhibition. Having said this, it is remarkable that the kinetics, the off kinetics is so quick, and therefore we will have to do more experiments to see whether this per se is sufficient to induce the changes, the neural changes that we know underlie addictive behavior. But if anything I have told you so far is true about the convergence of addictive drugs onto the dopamine system, then there is one straightforward experiment that we should be able to do in order to demonstrate that that in itself is sufficient to drive some of the adaptive changes. And what we want to do now is to take control of the VTA dopamine neurons by transfecting channel rhodopsin into them. And so by using a dat cream mouse and the floxed version of channel rhodopsin, we have first infection of all neurons in the VTA, but recombination only in the dopamine neurons. And we can then visualize that by looking with light sheet microscopy at the projection of all dopamine neurons that originate here in the ventral tegmental area and project up to the nucleus accumbens that you see here. So this is the anterior commissure here, the rostral and the caudal limb. So that would be the lateral shell and the medial shell. And here in between, we have the core. And you can already appreciate that the accumbens really is one of the strongest projection sites for dopamine uh, axons coming from the ventral tegmental area. We can then go one step further and test the functionality of this by giving the mouse control over its own dopamine neuron activity. So what she does here is actually press that lever. And when she does so, that activates a laser that goes into the dopamine neurons and activates them. And we can then, again, with the D-light, uh, control and monitor and confirm that this indeed is very efficient in driving saturating concentration of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So here we have a system that we call ODAS, optogenetic dopamine neuron self-stimulation, that gives a way to test the commonality of the drugs and see how, to which extent that actually is sufficient. And we see that animals really are reinforcing that behavior and are not deterred if they work a little hard to work a little harder in order to get their laser stimulation. So here, what we have is fixed ratio one, two, and three. And you can see that they go to the maximal possible laser stimulations in all of these mice. Obviously, beyond this acquisition phase, we want to use this to test what happens if we increase the constraint to it, that is, Every second, every third laser stimulation is then paired uh, 
with a punishment in the form of a light electric shock, which is our negative consequence that we're gonna to try to see whether the animal is willing to overcome that. And when we do that, and we have done many animals, this was the first series of about a hundred animals. Meanwhile, we have done a few hundred more and all animals do react to this uh, painful stimulus, but there is a huge variance in how they adapt to these punishments. And I have highlighted one animal here in purple, which basically continues unabated, whereas the green one essentially stops uh, self-stimulating. Now, in order to understand how this comes about and whether this is just a, a Gaussian distribution or whether there is something else going on, we have looked at many different parameters and basically just color coded them. So each column here is an animal and we start with the baseline sessions and then we have the punishment sessions and then we look at the laser stimulation numbers after every third laser, laser press. Uh, we look at many other different parameters. I have only listed four here. And here the columns just reflect the animals in the order we carry out the experiments. And there's really not much you can see in terms of patterning of that. But what we can do is we can use this and do a unsupervised clustering algorithm. And then after dimensional reduction, look at the projections and voila, what you then see is two distinct groups. So we have a group of animals that is clearly sensitive to the punishment and will reduce the self-stimulation. And we have another group that is resistant and that we can then use the position in these clusters to regroup and reshuffle our data. And now what you can see is clearly that there are two groups that are emerging. And the clustering algorithm also gives us the dendrogram. And so that dendrogram confirms the two classes. So we're, we're clearly not in a situation where we have a, just a Gaussian distribution of a large variance, but we start to have a multimodal distribution. We have two peaks that emerge, one of which we're gonna call the persevering animals and one, the renouncing animals. And now what is interesting, although I did not fully quantify this, but you can appreciate that you actually have more than half of the animals that persevere and continue self-stimulating despite these negative consequences. And we'll see that this is in stark contrast to what I told you in the beginning with addictive drugs, where it is clearly a minority of individuals that become addicted. So the model that is slowly starting to emerge here is that we have different types of addictive drugs or by the same token, self-stimulation of uh, VTA dopamine neurons that converge onto one common mechanism. They obviously each have their individual specific mechanism, but they converge on one mechanism, which is the increase of mesolimbic dopamine. And already 10 years ago, we have then postulated that the effect of that mesolimbic dopamine transient is a change in synaptic transmission particularly of excitatory afferents onto medium spiny neurons. We call this drug evoked synaptic plasticity and the hypothesis we put forward is that this could be a neural correlate of the adaptive behavior, which essentially falls into two classes, one of which is early and seen in all individuals and at the later stage compulsion where you have this stochastic element and only some animals will become compulsive under the other will not. So somehow at this convergence between the ascending dopamine projection and the cortical afferents onto these inhibitory medium spiny neurons, something special is going on. And there is actually much evidence that at this tripartite synapse, special rules of synaptic plasticity apply. So here in green, we have our medium spiny neuron we have excitatory afferents onto the spines of these spiny neurons, and we have ascending dopamine projections into the uh, sort of the neck of these spines. And what happens is that there are two scenarios, essentially that you, simple scenarios that you can think of. First, one has to realize that since dopamine neurons 
have a sort of a pacemaker activity. There's always some dopamine that is released. So there's a dopamine concentration as baseline. But when bursts or strong stimulation arises, you have surges of dopamine. Conversely, it is also possible that for reasons, for example, of aversive stimuli, these dopamineurons shut down and that then would lead to a dip of dopamine. And from many uh, work of many different labs, Jim Surmeyer and, and, and Marina Wolf and, and so forth, we have learned that there, depending on which dopamine receptor these MSNs express, certain rules of plasticity apply. So for example, in the case of a search, only D1 receptor expressing medium spiny neurons can express long-term potentiation. That LTP in the D2 is clearly inhibited. Conversely, in the D2, we do have a situation where a surge promotes the induction of LTD. And conversely, that actually is relatively recent data by in particularly the Kazai group in Japan, it has been shown that the D2 receptor expressing MSNs, when there is a dip of dopamine, have that possibility of potentiating afferents onto those neurons. So clearly there's an interesting set of how these plasticity comes about, come about based on their expression of the different GPCRs, which obviously has something to do with which G proteins they couple to. One is the G alpha uh, olfaction and the other one is the GIO. So now with all of that in mind, I would like now to really turn back and examine the case of cocaine because it is a little bit more complicated than that because cocaine does not only increase dopamine, but it also increases serotonin and norepinephrine. And as I already said before, we know from much clinical, clinical literature that the transition to compulsion is about 20% of all users. So obviously one question then is, how do these different types of uh, targets contribute to that transition? We know that the dopamine transporter itself is obviously very important for the increase of dopamine. And we know this from the seminal work from Howard Gu uh, in the early 2000s, where he generated a mouse that contained the dopamine transporter that no longer bound cocaine. So this is a dopamine transporter knock-in and that can take up dopamine just fine, but will not bind cocaine. And under these circumstances, compared to the wild type, these knock-ins will not show a cocaine transient here, the black dots in response to the injection of a single dose of cocaine. The increase with amphetamine is still partially there. Uh, that has to do something with the different binding sites and the different molecular mechanism of amphetamine compared to cocaine. And as a result, there was no self-administration of cocaine and no early adaptive behavior. And I'm showing here you only the condition place pre preference, which was abolished. So clearly one of the differences then between the cocaine self-administration and self-stimulation of dopamine neurons, our ODAS model was that here we're having a sort of multi-modal uh, induction, whereas with the ODAS, it's a pure dopaminergic way. And as I said, we have about 20% of transition to addiction here and 60% here. And so, with all of that in mind and what I told you before, the hypothesis in the lab emerged that maybe some of these other targets actually could be acting as a break to the transition to uh, compulsion. And in particularly, serotonin could be sort of a force against that transition. So we wanted to test this. And the first thing we did, and that is thanks to a postdoc in my lab, Linda Simler, who uh, did a postdoc with Randy Blakely, who in his lab already generated a 
analog to the dopamine transporter knock-in by using the serotonin transporter knock-in. So they made point mutations in the serotonin transporter with the exact same goal, that is to generate a transporter that would take up serotonin, but no longer buying cocaine. So first, we were we were we wanted to definitely validate whether the mouse is what it was supposed to be. And we did this thanks to the so-called S light. So in analogy to the D light, this is a fluorescent marker, a fluorescent uh, indicator that allows us to visualize serotonin in the brain. And we got this from Yu Long Li at Peking University. And so here we put now in the striatum an injection of the S light and we inject cocaine. And then as you can see in a wild type, we have a nice increase in serotonin that is abolished in the serotonin knock-in and indistinguishable from an injection of saline. Yes, so indeed the serotonin knock-in mice are exactly what we're looking for. So we have nice increase in dopamine, but no more transients of serotonin. So now the first thing obviously we wanted to do is to see whether that had any effect on cocaine self-administration. So here you see the lever presses as well as the infusion and absolutely there was no difference between the wild type and the cert knock-ins. We then introduced the punishment and you can already see that we also seem to have some animals, this is one individual that basically stopped all self-infusion, self-administration where other animals went all the way. So here is now all the data of all the animals that we look and we have again a number of parameters that we look at in order not to be biased by an artificial cutoff. And the line I would like you to focus on is this on the top here, where we have the coding of the genotype. So we have the purple are the knock ins, and the green are the wild types. And when you now look at the dendrogram, where on the left we have the persevering animals and on the right the renouncer, you can already see that, yes, indeed, we seem to have more green animals, so wild types in the right, and more of the persevering on the left. And yes, indeed, when we compared just the fraction of animals that were here and here, you see that in the serotonin knock-in animals, we had many more animals that made the transition from controlled to compulsive. There was no correlation between the perseverance rate and the baseline infusion. So the number of infusion or how highly motivated, and also we looked at breakpoints uh, before we introduced the punishment could not give us a clue whether the animal will become a compulsive or a non-compulsive animal. So with that in mind, we did the converse experiment. So now what we're gonna do is we use our pure dopamine type of addiction, which is this ODAS, and artificially through pharmacological means increase serotonin. And the most straightforward way to do that is to use an SSRI, we use citalopram. And again, we validated that this had no impact on acquisition. So uh, that was really unchanged. You see that the two treatment groups overlap. And again, we had animals that were clearly uh, stopping and others that were uh, uh, persevering. And here we have now the same graph that you're now familiar with. And we have here the uh, saline treated, which are clearly more on the left, the persevering side, and on the other side, we have the purple, the citalopram treatment, which are much more in the cluster of the renouncing ones. So now, remember, we had about 60% of persevering animals with pure ODAS. We can actually make this go down to 15 to 20% when we treat these animals with citalopram. And once again, no change, no correlation between baseline and persevering. So we have a bi-directional effect if we take a uh, animal where cocaine no longer increases serotonin, we have more compulsive animals. And if we use a paradigm that is purely dopaminergic and artificially increase the serotonin, we have less. So, so somehow these two forces seem to be opposing. But maybe 
what we're actually looking at is a model like this, where serotonin would not be a direct force against the transition, but would be a modulator of the dopamine function. And we wanted to test this. In order to do that, we needed to know where to look in the brain. And from our previous work, we knew that this is something we had to extract through uh, experiments where we would control for the, uh, uh, the, the, the electric shocks. Because obviously a persevering animals, by the fact that it persevered, uh, and I'm gonna run this movie once again, uh, does receive more electric shocks. So in order to exclude this as a confound, we did experiments where we would have what we call a so-called York control. So each animal that was in charge here with the optogenetic self-stimulation was yoked to an animal here that uh, was totally innocent. But whenever this animal here got a shock, this one also got a shock. So we had a group of animals that just had the shocks and the number and the timing of the shocks exactly as the one that were in charge. So under these circumstances, we can then look at CFOS expression as an activity marker. And we essentially have five groups. So we have naive animals, we have persevering animals and renouncing animals. And then to each of those, we have a yog to persevere and yog to renouncing. And I'm only of course showing here you the, the, the areas that uh, we eventually ended up working with, but we looked through 20 different brain areas and quantified the expression of CFOS. So here we have a part of the prefrontal cortex, the prelimbic cortex, and that is in contrast with the lateral orbitofrontal cortex. And you can see that in both animals, we have more CFOS positive neurons in persevering than in renouncing animals. And of course, also when compared to the naive ones. However, we had a similar difference in the yog to persevering versus yog to renouncing one. In other words, arguing that the sheer fact of experience more or less pain already had an effect on the CFOS expression in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is why this was not really the area that we were most interested in. This difference was not seen. There was actually no reaction to, uh, this, to, to the pain in the, in the OFC. So for us, this was sort of a bona fide uh, interest, a region of interest, because here we had something where activity correlated largely between the degree with which the animal would persevere in the optogenetic self-stimulation. So what do we know about the OFC and its connections to regions such as the striatum? And uh, so we had to learn a little bit about the anatomy, which of course we did mostly in the, in the textbooks, but then we also did some own anatomical investigations. And what you see here is again, a uh, light sheet uh, 3D uh, reconstruction of an animal where the uh, fluorescent dye was injected into the central part of the dorsal striatum. And then we will look at the afferents. And what you could see is that one of the big groups of cells that have afferents to the central uh, part of the dorsal striatum is the orbitofrontal cortex. And obviously I'm always showing you this because I, I really, I, I like these images of the genetically controlled anatomy that allows you to do this with very high resolution. So our model that we had initially that I showed you in a very simple version in the beginning that starts with the VTA, the nucleus accumbens, and its afferents from MPFC that change when uh, early adaptive behavior emerges needs to be amended by these more dorsal connections because it is the OFC that projects to the dorsal striatum, which receives its dopamine input from the substantia nigra compacta. Uh, we also know from and particularly Susan Haber's seminal work in the early 2000s, that these two streams are actually connected. So there is a spiraling connectivity between the ventral dopaminergic projections because the MSNs that project back to the midbrain, so those of the, if you will, direct pathway, they actually make synapses preferentially to the GABA neurons in the VTA, 
from where there is a sort of lateral projection to neighboring dopamine neurons. And if you can imagine after a few loops, you end up in more dorsal uh, areas. So clearly there is a, a connection between those two and it sort of dawn on us that maybe what's happening here is, is, is a ventral to dorsal gradient that with time goes from a control to a compulsive uh, behavior. But now let's look what we find in terms of actual neural changes. And so with our ODAS in the compulsive animal that we, what we saw is clearly that this OFC to dorsal striatum connection was strongly potentiated. I'm showing here the AMPA component, the fast, uh, quick one, and the slower one. And when you normalize to the NMDA, clearly in persevering, we always had bigger NMDA currents. And this and other experiments we did led us to conclude that, yes, indeed, there is a strengthening of this OFC in, uh, to, dors to dorsal striatum in compulsive animal. There's a very nice correlation Whenever the perseverance is high, you have a high AMPA and MDA ratio, and the converse is true. And interestingly, and I'm happy to take this on in the discussion, this was true for both afferents onto D1 and to D2 spiny projection neurons. And we can discuss what that means in terms of how this can come about. Importantly, beyond the correlation, we were able to provide links of causality. That is, when you take a persevering animal that has potentiated synapses and artificially induce LTD through an optogenetic projection targeting experiment, you can actually make that animal renouncing. And the converse, you can make renouncers by implying an LTP protocol into uh, uh, persevering animals. So now going back to our situation, with cocaine and these various uh, knock-ins. So we wanted to first, of course, confirm that with cocaine, we also had this increase of AMPA and MDH, and it was not just something special to the ODAS. And what I'm showing you here is the initial experiments with the CERT knock-in and the wild type compared to the saline and the citalopram with the ODAS. And in all eight groups, uh, the renouncing and the persevering, we looked at AMPA and MDA ratios. And you can see that each time there was a perseverer, there was a high AMPA and MDA ratio. And each time we looked at slices from renouncing animals, there was a relatively low AMPA and MDA ratio. So yes, indeed, and this is the group data, we strongly believe that it is a common mechanism that explains the compulsion in response to cocaine and ODAS. So what could serotonin do on these uh, synapses? And uh, this is a very straightforward slice experiment where we uh, applied serotonin and just looked at the size of these uh, responses. And you can see that in situation of normal ACSF or when blocking 1H, uh, 1, uh, 1A receptors, we do have a clear decrease. So there is evidence for presynaptic inhibition, which was also confirmed by changes in synaptic parameters, such as one over CV square and pair pulled ratio, which we know change when there are presynaptic mechanisms at play. Interestingly now, when we use this NAS compound in NAS181, that is a selective blocker of the 5-HT1B receptor, we no longer had this presynaptic inhibition. So our sort of prime suspect is that serotonin through activating this GIO coupled 5-HT1B receptor presynaptically, it would lower the release probability. So we validated this in a uh, mouse where with uh, intersectional uh, circuit knockout technology, we we're able to abolish the 5-HT1B receptor selectively in the OFC neurons that project to the dorsal striatum. And to validate that this knockdown really does what it's supposed to do is that we use now this uh, 5-HT1B agonist, this CP com uh, compound, which in the knockout no longer has an effect what usually is seen in the control wild types. So we have now a mouse, and obviously we did not only do this to confirm our slice experiments, but 
we wanted to do the behavioral experiment, of course, with this mouse. So we're now having a mouse that lacks 5-HT1B receptor selectively in the OFC to dorsal striatum. And we go through this same battery of tests. We're gonna go and do the self-administration. As you can see, that uh, is unchanged when you look at lever presses. With fixed ratio, they have to increase, obviously. And there's also no change in the number of infusions. Now we go here, and you can clearly see that, uh, again, we have on the left side the persevering animals, all our parameters we took into account. We look at the genotype here. And again, the purple ones are more on the left, the olive ones more on the right. And when you do the very simple bar graph, you can see that uh, we actually increase the transition in those animals from 13 to 57%. Again, no change, uh, no correlation as a function of the number of baseline infusions. So in order to take all of that together, what we have here is a situation where in a wild type animal, the uh, cocaine would increase serotonin in the dorsal striatum such that these 5-HT1B receptors have a negative impact on the release probability, which then makes the likelihood of inducing the plasticity that we know underlies the compulsion much lower, and we end up with a relatively no, low number of individuals that eventually are compulsive. In the certain knock-in, this increase no longer occurs because cocaine cannot bind to the uh, transporter. And so there's simply no serotonin protection, if you will. There's a lot of uh, uh, release here of, of these glutamate synapses and we end up with about 60%. And that matches what we see when we have a process where nothing is serotoninergic, that is with our ODAS. Now, in the final condition, where we selectively take out this purple 5-HT1B receptor in the terminals of the OFC to dorsal striatum axons, we end up with a lot of serotonin because now cocaine still can increase it, but it has, has no effect on these synapses and the plasticity required for the compulsion can be readily induced and we end up with 57% of the addicted animals. So yes, indeed, we believe that something special is going on here at the level of this uh, transition from controlled to compulsive use, and that this has a lot of to do with uh, sort of staged forms of synaptic plasticity starting in the ventral part of uh, the uh, mesolimbic system, and then through these spiraling connectivity ending up eventually in the projection that really drives the compulsion, the one by, between the OFC and the dorsal striatum. And this is sort of the how positive reinforcement could lead to compulsive use. So obviously, this may be a little different in drugs such as opiates, where withdrawal plays a really important role. And we would like now to understand how, what exactly are the circuits of this negative reinforcement and how they eventually converge and do the job together and if, if they converge and how and when and through which cellular and molecular mechanisms. So this is sort of a, a little bit some of the plans we have for the future. But for now, let me just uh, acknowledge, close and acknowledge the people in the lab. And so this is the first author on the paper looking at the serotonin modulation of the transition is Yue Li, a postdoc uh, uh, from China who is looking for positions. Um, and then most of the work was based on earlier work by Vincent Pascoli, who developed uh, the model of the optogenetic dopamine self-stimulation. And we now have an entire group of people who are following it up. And then Fabrice, for example, is now the lead investigator on our project on how negative reinforcement can uh, contribute to the transition to compulsion. And with that, the last thing I need to do, and I am happy to do that, is to thank you for your attention. And uh, obviously also all the funders, in particular the Swiss National Science Foundation and the European Research Council
for the financing of this uh, research. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Christian. That was fantastic. Uh, uh, Kurt's going to be our moderator for the questions. Please put your questions into the Q&A. Um, and while we're waiting for you to type in your questions, I do have a, a couple questions for you, Christian. Yeah. Um, and Kurt, you can cut me off since you're moderating. Uh, <laughs> the first, of course, is the human implications. Um, is there evidence that, for example, individuals who are taking SSRIs chronically or um, who are given SSRIs uh, have any difference in their likelihood of having compulsive cocaine use? Yeah, so one important element is that this seems to be a mechanism that can work in prophylactic uh, situation. That is, we did try, once the compulsion was established, to reverse it by applying the citalopram after the facts that did not have the effect we were looking for. So clearly it is what exactly you were alluding to. It would be people who take SSRI for other indications such as depression, are they more or less likely to become addicted to cocaine? I think that's a really interesting question, but I'm not aware of a human <laughs> study where someone had the idea to look for that in a prospective fashion. And then I have a similar question, but on the mouse side. Uh, so you uh, spoke nicely about the knock-in mice, which are an elegant model of making either the serotonin transporter or the dopamine transporter originally insensitive to cocaine, but it still has its normal effect on dopamine transport. So you don't yeah. have the kinds of pre and post synaptic adaptations that would occur if you had no transporter and you yeah. had abnormally long uh, dwell time of dopamine in the synapse. Yeah. Way back in the 90s, yeah. um, the dopamine transporter knockout mice, uh, which do have uh, a complete lack of the uh, dopamine transporter, are still alive, um, have abnormally long uh, dopamine transients, were able to show some of the behavioral consequences of cocaine administration. Yeah. And that suggests that once you have the kinds of adaptations in LTP and LTD that you talked about with your delight, uh, with your um, ODAS, uh, that in fact, serotonin may act differently. So um, do, do you have any feeling um, for whether you can switch the sign of uh, serotonin's effects once you uh, induce the LTP or the LTD? Yeah, so this is a very interesting thought. And what you're referring to is Mark Carone's work in the early, very early 2000, when he created the DAT knockout. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it is clear that at the time it was difficult to monitor the dopamine in these knockout animals. And in hindsight, we know now that uh, they have massively increased dopamine levels. And so many things are possible in these uh, situations, including some of the synaptic adaptations that we are talking about. And it is well possible that this is uh, a mechanism through which uh, then cocaine and other monoamine transporters still can, can have a reinforcing effect. It, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, and I think it would be probably interesting to go back and look at these mice and see which of the mechanisms are already engaged. And we probably can learn something about the adaptability of the system in these very artificial situations. I, I guess I have a question too, and then while the questions yeah. are rolling in. Um, so the link between the OFC to the stratum made me remind me of the work from Tina Gremmel and Ruby Cost and David Lovinger about how in alcohol seeking, this exact same circuit mediates the switch from goal directed to habitual alcohol seeking. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, they showed that that was endocannabinoid mediated. I'm wondering if you think that this is like a common switch. I know we're using a lot of terms here, like habitual and compulsion. I wonder yeah, so, maybe so, you can think a little bit about what you mean by yeah. compulsion so, here. So I think precisely because you mentioned the term habitual, this is sort of a, a two schools of thought in the addiction field. So some people say um, compulsion is an extreme form of habits that you can no longer disengage. Whereas others say that uh, compulsion is an extreme form of goal-directed behavior where you basically narrow your choices into something very, very simple. I mean, I'm not sure I have fully taken sides yet in this uh, discussion, 
but it is clearly something we need to keep in mind. And uh, our own work, so we did one study where we looked, so the, the habitual system, most people would agree that this is something that involves changes in the dorsal lateral part of the, stri of the, of the dorsal striatum. And so we did have a study where one of the students, Masaya Harada, very systematically looked at MPFC to more dorsomedial striatum, uh, OFC to dorsal central, and then M1 to dorsal lateral. And the adaptations that we saw were only seen in the central part, OFC to central. So I'm not so sure exactly how that, uh, which is still, of course, no argument that uh, the habit system doesn't play a role because you could just be too late to that, see it there. You would have to see it at every different stage. And this is one of the studies we actually have underway is I told you a little bit now about how these changes are expressed, but we didn't talk about how it actually is induced and when it comes about, when does the compulsion, when is the switch really happening? And that is something I guess we need to do now is to really look at the different stages in the process. So what, for example, is already there at the end of the acquisition, what happens then during the first punishment and how does that develop into what we have now described at the very end once the animal is fully committed. The interesting thing is once it is committed, it stays committed. So you can actually make then pauses up to several months. And when you take these animals back they are already in the cluster they were before. And that actually, for me, was also a very interesting observation and, and, and advocates once again for the ODAS model because these very long experiments where you need to keep the access over months are simply almost impossible with self-administration of a drug. Maybe it's a quick follow-up to that. Are these animals like the Maybe certain Maybe we should outcomes? move to some of our participants' I know, I, questions I, I, before I will. we'll come back to you, Kurt. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's one here from Valerie Darcy at NIDDK who says the work is exciting. And it seems, to, she, it, they say that it seems that serotonin works here to dampen dopamine release, it seems. Do you anticipate a synergistic effect of dampening dopamine if GABA were enhanced as well? Or is there more nuance between the interactions of GABA, serotonin, and dopamine that might complicate that? Yeah, so it's also a very interesting question. For me, GABA and glutamate are the targets of these modulations. And so I didn't talk about this yet, but we do have, and this is some of the work of Megan Creed, we have evidence that GABAergic transmission also can undergo these drug evoked synaptic plasticities. It's then in that particular case, mostly a presynaptic form. So for us, GABA is not sort of the actor, it's the, it is downstream of what happens with the dopamine and serotonin. I'm not aware, I mean, we know that dopamine can do some of these modulations, probably serotonin too, but I, I, I don't have a good example now that comes to mind. Okay, and then we have another question from Ankush Chakraborty, who is at, wondering about, I think along the lines of Marina's questions about the, the translational aspect of this is how you think, say like systemic inflammation or, or other sort of disorders that induce inflammation, those obviously affect serotonin levels. And do you think that those might have influences on like the a transition potentially? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I mean, this is an extremely exciting thought that you could say that maybe people who are vulnerable have something and somehow an altered serotonin system. And that could be many, many different uh, ways of that, how that they could produce less serotonin. They could have receptors that are less efficient, or they could have inflammation modulating the function at large. So I think, I, I really think it would be great if we would have ways to asset that and, and, and see how individual differences of how serotonin functions in the brain of someone conveys vulnerability. But that's a really interesting thought. I guess we were still in the early process to see what are all the different possibilities of, 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 of the vulnerabilities. And it's probably not gonna be one. I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna be many. And, and, and so one way of 
we trying to get at that a little bit is to try to take biopsies in the circuit we know that are involved and do single cell mRNA-seq on those cells be, and then look in which category they fall. So that's, that's some of the approaches we have. And then we have a question here wondering about, because the OFC is sort of ex somewhat accessible, I guess, in humans, if you think that's possible that an approach like TDCS or TMS stimulation in humans could potentially reverse this. Although you were mentioning that it's harder in the mice, you think to switch them back from being compulsive once it's already been established. So no, 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 definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that we're getting back from these very deep structures onto something more at the surface. And I, been always been a great advocate of deep brain stimulation. I, I, I think this is a really cool uh, uh, technique. And, and, and I'm, as a neurologist myself, I'm actually involved in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. But I also came to realize that DBS for addiction is probably going to be very difficult. It's just too difficult to motivate people to undergo these kind of invasive procedures. So if we had a technology that would allow us to access the OFC, through you know, special magnetic coils under your eyes or something like that, that of course, that would be very cool. Having said this, you know, we're coming from optogenetics where we genetically address specific cells in specific circuits. And so if you start to play with a magnet, then of course you lose some of this precision. So it needs a little bit, but I think it is a good example of how we, the question now is we actually know what we should be doing. The question now becomes, can we do it and how can we do it with a technique that would be uh, we, we, where we would be allowed to use it in humans? And I think that is exactly a little bit along these lines that we think there's a new way of doing translation in circuit neuroscience. We have a lot of different mechanisms that we now know sh definitely do something in the animal model. And now the question becomes, how can we actually do this in humans? Right. So we think we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, yes. And uh, I wanna thank you again, uh, Christian, for a fantastic talk, really nice way to uh, round up this series. Thank uh, you. I wanna thank Kurt for uh, excellent uh, question and hosting management. Thank and you. I wanna yeah. thank all of our audience members for taking the time to be here. Please let everyone in your labs know that these um, talks are available on YouTube and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing back from you. Okay, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. It's been great being.